Welcome back to another T-SQL tutorial. So we are continuing our discussion of the T-SQL language. In our last video, we were kind of kicking off the series where we began working with SQL Server and we saw how to work with Excel files. In this particular little mini series, what we're gonna be doing is working with API request from the T-SQL, uh, well, I guess using the T-SQL language, but requesting APIs from SQL Server. Now, like the last video, there is some kind of uh, setup that we have to do in order to make what we're about to do work. Additionally, this also does assume that you do have um, administration access to your SQL Server. Um, if that's not the case, you would have to work with somebody then to uh, basically configure the features that you want to be using. Now, there's really only uh, two things that you would have to do at this point. Technically, if you saw my previous video, there's actually only one thing you have to do. Um, the first thing that you have to do is you have to turn on the feature Show Advanced Options. By turning on the Show Advanced Options feature, you're basically saying, hey, there's other features that I want to configure um, that by default you're, you don't see. And when you turn this feature on, it will allow you to see those features. And it's very simple. It's just uh, execute uh, to store procedure configure. Uh, the feature we want to configure is show advanced options, and we want to set that to one. If you watched my other video and you've already run this command, guess what? You don't have to do it. However, the second command that you would have to run is called understanding, well, sorry, not understanding, uh, you have to configure the OLE automation procedures. So this is another feature that you need to turn on. When you use the OLE automation procedures option, basically what you're allowing SQL Server to do is create new instances of OLE automation objects within your query batches. So that's pretty cool because in order to do what we need to do, we're gonna actually have to create an instance of an OLE automation object that we can then tap into the methods and properties of that object. And so when you're configuring this feature and you turn it on, basically what you're saying is, hey, we wanna be able to create instances of these objects from our queries. So it's really important when you do this because then we can also create our objects. Um, kind of to save time a little bit, I guess that's maybe one way to put it. Um, what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to copy some of my code just to kind of get us started a little bit. And then I'm kind of just going to kind of mostly go over it for the most part. Um, for the most part, it's not super complicated, uh, but I'll kind of show you what we'll get up to this point. And so for the most part, this is all pretty standard. Um, really all I'm doing uh, from this point up is I'm declaring some variables that I'm planning to use in my query. And so whenever we declare a variable in T-SQL, we use the declare keyword, we do an at symbol, and then the name of the variable that we want to declare along with its specified data type. In this case, I'm creating two variables that are related to the object that we're going to be creating. The at token variable is really designed as almost like kind of like a almost like a, a reference to the object. And so by calling this at token um, variable, really what we're saying is, hey, use the object that we've created a reference to. And then this at ret, it's kind of like um, like the return value. So we're going to be calling properties and methods that belong to our object and we want the response of those calls to be stored in a variable because you might want to do things like raise an error if you call a certain method, for example, and the response doesn't come back correctly. So if that's the case, we would store it in this response kind of, or I kind of saved the return variable. Additionally, we're going to also declare some variables that are related to our actual request. So we're going to have a URL. This is just going to be an end bar char. I mean, technically, it probably could be 256 characters, and that's fine. Um, in my particular example, I'm not going to have an authentication header or a content type, but I'll kind of show you what it looks like. 
and how you would integrate that in if the particular API that you're going to be working with does require those two pieces of information. We're going to also have an API key. That's pretty self-explanatory. If we're working with APIs, most APIs require an API key of some fashion. Uh, this final part, it might look a little confusing at this point, but really all I'm doing is I'm creating a new variable. It's called at JSON. It's going to be a table with one column, and that column is going to be of the data type nvarchar max. This is kind of a little trick that we're going to be using in order to actually display the JSON string once we request it and once it's sent back. Um, unfortunately, at least I'm pretty sure I can't say 100%, um, anything over 4,000 characters we can't actually print out. And so what we have to do is store it in a table first, and then we can actually um, see that value. So it's kind of a little bit of a workaround, but once we do that, usually you're good to go. Okay, so at that point, you've declared your variables. You would really just kind of go on and start uh, setting them equal to certain values that you're gonna you know, obviously do. Now, in this case, I just put a very fake basic authentication header. This is actually not one you would use, um, but it's the same basic, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, so on and so on. Uh, content type, this obviously would change too, depending on the API that you're working with. But the important part that you need to just recognize is that these are just simply strings. It's just text. There's really nothing fancy about it. Um, and for the most part, though, we're not actually going to be using that in our particular example. But I do want to show you kind of how to declare them and then how you would use the methods to set them and things like that. The important part is definitely our API key. So I'm setting my API key equal to the result of a query. So I actually have a table in my Sigma coding database that contains all my API services. So these are the API services that I use. And really all I'm doing is I'm going to select the API key column from the API services table where the service name equals Alpha Vantage. So surprise, surprise, we're going to be doing the Alpha Vantage API in this particular tutorial. Once I have that API key and I've stored it in my variable, I then go on to define my URL. So I set my at URL variable to a particular um, query, and then I just concatenate on the result of my uh, query up above. So this is just joining two strings, uh, basically combining them. So that way it creates a valid URL that we can then make a request with. Obviously, depending on how dynamic you wanted to make your query, you could potentially make each one of these parameters um, variables uh, on their own. So you could have something where the user would pass through some information. Um, for example, I'm assuming not everyone's going to want to do Microsoft or something like that. Um, so really, you would kind of follow the same logic you were doing up here. You would just declare your variables, and then you would just concatenate them um, all together into a single valid URL. And there's ways where you can make this dynamic where um, you can call like a store procedure and that store procedure um, makes a request or something along that nature. So there's ways around it, but just know it's possible to do it in this particular example, though, just to keep things simple, we're not going to be doing that. Okay, so once you've gotten to that point, we can now go on and actually start creating our object and then calling the methods and properties of that object. So the first thing we need to do is create a new object. Uh, this particular object that we're going to be working with, if you've seen um, my other videos in VBA, it's going to look very familiar because it's actually one we've worked with before. So this is kind of cool. This is something I thought was interesting um, is we can actually call uh, certain libraries that we've used in VBA from SQL Server because a lot of them are OLE objects at the end of the day. Uh, the, the object that we're going to be creating is the msxml.xml HTTP object. And so all we're doing is we're going to do the store procedure OA create. So this is going to create a new instance of that OLE object. And then we're going to specify the kind of the reference, if you want to think of it, the reference to this particular object that we can then call down the road. So we're going to say out. And all this is doing is saying, hey, create a new instance of that object, uh, store a reference to it in this token variable. And then also the response of that actual request of creating it, store that in this another variable called at rep. And then this is where you can kind of do some fun stuff where after making that call, you can check and say, hey, 
you know, did you actually create anything? Because, you know, for example, maybe the user doesn't have the library installed or something along that nature. There's a whole host of things that can go wrong. But what you can do is you can say, hey, if my value doesn't equal zero, then what you're going to say is unable to open HTTP connection because the XML HTTP object is really going to allow us to create a new uh, HTTP connection from SQL Server. We can specify a severity level and then I can't honestly remember what the last parameter is. Um, I'll put that in documentation, but I can't think of it on top of my head right now. Uh, but really, so the first thing is, um, anytime it's not zero, that means an error was raised. And so if it's zero, it means you're good to go. So we want the situation where it was not zero. And if it wasn't zero, we're gonna raise an error. And then the severity level is basically saying, um, depending on the severity, what do you want me to do? Do you want it to just like, connect, I mean, disconnect uh, to, from the actual database or something like that. Um, it really depends. There's different levels. I can put a link in the documentation. Uh, depending on the level you choose, you might not actually be able to do it because it does require certain system privileges. And if you don't have those system privileges, guess what? You can't um, basically raise that kind of level of severity. In this case, it's 10. So 10 is like it's a mild one, I guess if that's a nice way to put it, but it's not like a super severe one where it's going to terminate connections and all sorts of things like that. So for the most part, that's fine. But that's how you would raise an error, you know, if something like that happened. Okay, from here, what we're going to start doing is we're going to start calling the different methods of our OLE object. And so when I'm saying the methods, I'm really talking about this new instance of that library. Now, in this particular library, there's a couple things we have to do. We have to first open a new connection. So what we're going to do is we're going to say execute, store the response of this execution. So whether it was successful or not, we're going to specify stored procedure OA method. So this is mean specifying a method. We're going to reference the object we want to call a method on. In this case, it's the at token. We got to specify the method. Um, and then we have null. And then we have get, so it's going to be a get request. We're going to pass through the URL, and then we're going to do false. I think if I remember correctly, um, this like isn't async. If I remember 100% correctly, I can't remember off the top of my head. But um, basically, what this is going to do is it's going to open a new connection, and we're going to be making a get request uh, using that particular OLE object. So. Hopefully that kind of makes sense at this point. Next, what we're going to do, and then, like I said, if you want, you could technically do like another raise error, but, you know, luckily for the most part, I haven't had any errors with this one, you know, knock on wood. Uh, the next one is also going to be uh, a token, I mean, uh, another method as well. Now, technically this one I uh, wouldn't be setting, but I want you guys to see, and this is the wonderful little glitch I love about T-SQLs that never seems to do it. If you want, you can set request headers. And so that's if you had an authentication header and a content type. So if you wanted to use these two guys up here, when you're making your request, it's exactly the same. It's still a method, but in this case, it's a set request header. And what you're going to do is you're going to say, hey, specify the authentication one, and then you're going to pass through the um, authentication header. So everything like that should be pretty good for the most part. Finally, what we're going to do is we're going to call the final method. So it's SPOA method. We're going to specify the object we want to call that method on. And in this case, there's no parameters that we're passing through. So we're just going to call the send method, which basically means just send the request as is. So we've uh, set our headers. We've opened a new connection. Now we want to send the request. Uh, so that way we're good to go. And from this point, hopefully the request is sent, you know, and there's no issues or anything like that. This is usually where the error happens. Um, unfortunately, uh, what can happen is you can actually have it where if you were to try to print the response of the response text that's sent back to us, uh, it wouldn't print anything. It would actually show a null. To kind of show you what that would look like, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say at JSON2, just so that way we can kind of see it. Um, we're going to say 
uh, uh, what is it? Execute. Um, uh, what is it? S P O A prop. Oh wait, O A get property. And then in this case, again, we're still using the object we've created. But in this case, I want to grab the property response text. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify where I want it to go to. So once you grab that property, um, do you want to specify an output? I do want to specify an output. I want to specify uh, JSON2, and I want this to be my output. And I just want to make sure everything's good on that one. Perfect. And then I'm going to try to print uh, at JSON2. And so this is usually where things break. Oh no. Oh, my bad. I forgot my two. Sorry about that. It was a two at the end. So this is usually what happens. It looks like everything went fine and then we don't have anything. And you're like, but I didn't see an error. So what's wrong? It's a glitch. Oh, it's not necessarily a glitch. I guess it's kind of just the built-in feature. What's happening is it's not able to print anything because the JSON string that's being sent back to us is actually like, you know, a couple thousand characters long. Uh, T-SQL basically says, hey, after 4,000, good luck, we're not gonna print it. So we have to do a little bit of a workaround. What we're gonna do is we're gonna instead, we're gonna do insert into, we're gonna insert into our JSON table that we defined up above. We're gonna specify the column we wanna insert into. And then we need to specify what we want to insert into it. Well, all I want to insert it is the result of this response text. Uh, well, basically the grabbing of that response text property. Additionally, I don't need this extra stuff at the end because um, it's you know, not necessary. I'm not actually uh, uh, setting it to an output. I want to insert it directly into a table. So the syntax is a little bit differently, a little bit different. So first thing is grab the response text property uh, and insert it directly into the table. This will fix the glitch. Wouldn't it be any fun if there's no glitch, right? <laughs> uh, from here, what we can do is we're going to say select star from uh, at JSON. So this is just so you can see and go, hey, it's actually working. Wonderful concept like when things work. We don't like when things don't work. Oh, of course I didn't specify it. Oh, that's what happens when you don't just do control A like you should. So, sorry if unfortunately if it's a little hard to read, but that's just kind of the size I'm stuck with. Um, but you can see there's now this massive JSON string that's been inserted into our table. So at this point, I'm gonna cut off the video in our next video, we're going to begin parsing this JSON string. And so we're going to start working with JSON in general uh, from T-SQL. It's not going to be a complete tutorial, but we'll at least be able to work with it in this instance. And I do have another video planned where we'll go into much more depth about how to use JSON from SQL Server. It's a really popular topic, and I think it will make a lot of people's lives easier. Uh, but with that being said, if you have any questions, feel free to put them down in the comments below. Then also, if you could, please make sure to like the video. Uh, we always appreciate the support. And if you're not already, please make sure to subscribe to the channel so that way you get regular updates as we release new videos. So thank you again for watching, everybody. We'll see you in video two.